Well, take a listen to this. Well, if you're like me and belong to a certain generation of Canadians who grew up in the 80s and 90s, there's a good chance that hearing that music might trigger a flood of childhood memories. That's because it's the theme song to Fred Penner's Place, a popular children's television show that ran on CBC from 1985 until 1997. It was hosted, of course, by Fred Penner. And over the course of almost a thousand episodes, he entertained his young viewers with stories, music, and words you remember the show, you might recall the famous Word Bird. And in the process, the show and Fred Penner influenced an entire generation of young Canadians. Fred Penner grew up in Winnipeg, and from a young age, he developed a love for music. But it was through playing songs for his younger sister Susie, who was born with Down syndrome, that he really came to see music as a way to make a positive impact on others. After graduating from the University of Winnipeg, he started performing and touring around Canada, both as a solo musician and as a member of various groups and acts. But it was in 1979 when he recorded his first LP of songs for children, The Cat Came Back, that his career really took off. The album became hugely popular and went on to sell more than 150,000 copies in Canada alone. Within a few years, Fred Penner was approached by the CBC and asked if he would be interested in developing a children's show based around his musical performances. And so Fred Penner's Place was born, and it quickly became one of the most popular and beloved children's shows on Canadian television. The show was abruptly cancelled by CBC in 1997, but Fred Penner never stopped touring or believing in the importance of music and what he was doing. It was a show that I certainly grew up with, uh, and I can only imagine how thoroughly impressed and proud my five-year-old self would be that I had the great pleasure of meeting and speaking with Fred Penner in person. I spoke to Fred Penner at our studio at CIUT in Toronto. Here's our conversation. Well, Fred Penner, welcome to the public. To the public. They're out there somewhere, are they? <laughs> I can't hear them. Yeah, yeah. somewhere. That's right. I, I think first for a lot of people like me who grew up watching you and, and watching Fred Penner's place, um, I think would be really curious to know how you became the Fred Penner we, we know and love from our childhood. Um, so you, you grew up mostly in, in Winnipeg? Yes, I was born and raised in Winnipeg. Uh, my dad was in the army. We lived in uh, in Gatineau, it was Hull back then in the mid fifties, and uh, uh, and and that was really where where the idea for Fred Penner's Place came from. You know, when I was four or in grade four, so nine ten years old. But the uh, but, but I, I lived in Winnipeg uh, all my life, and I've always been a a, a a fairly sensitive young man, you know, being very aware of what's around me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a middle child, so always the, 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 the pacifier, trying to get the balance in, in things, uh, for those of you who are into uh, age or position. Uh, so I, I've, I, I don't feel like uh, the, the character, the person I am now, and the whole Fred Penner persona is really uh, as as much what you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have not had to assume a different role to do this. Uh, and, and that's been really important for me. Uh, you said the idea came from your time in Hull? Oddly, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I lived in, uh, in, on Dufferin Street in, in Hull. And one Easter, I, I had a quarter in my pocket. And I walked past a pet store, and there was a pen filled with baby chicks, multicolored. They they'd injected color into the eggs so that the that the baby's wings would be colored. So there were there were everything. So I I bought I bought a, a red baby chick for twenty five cents and big sign twenty five cents. Perfect. This is for me. Brought it home, and my mother was raised on the farm, so she was excited about that and said we should really get another one so you have someone to someone to play with for the chicken when you're at school. And so we had two chickens running around the yard, and they grew into full-sized hens or roosters. I, they, they weren't sure what they were. <laughs> uh, but, but then I came home one day from school, and my mother said, I have bad news for you. You know, one of your chickens was killed by the white cat over the, over the fence. It was still there, so I, I was devastated, you know, 10 years old. 
Uh, but I took it upon myself to bury the the cat, or the yeah, I would have liked to bury the cat, <laughs> bury, bury the chicken. And and there was a bush we had in the backyard, and this is where the connection happens. It was a big, you know, very very lush, full, whatever kind of bush it was. And the way to get into it was by crawling underneath into this space that was that was protected, that was quiet. I think you know every child has. Uh, a, a part of their life, uh, part of their their uh, their house, their room, their yard, where where they can just go. This is where I feel comfortable, and this was a, one of those comfort spots for me. So I crawled underneath, into this little bush area, the branches above me, and I dug a grave, and I had a, a fossil, a little trilobite fossil that I'd found, and so I, I buried the chicken, covered it up, and put this as the as the grave marker, but it was. It was a very sensitive and uh, and an emotional place for me, obviously. And then, you know, how many years later, when uh, CBC called and and asked if I wanted to do a TV series out of the blue, uh, and they said, I said, what do I do? They said, well, think about it. What if you had your druthers? What would you like to do? Mm-hmm. And my and my brain didn't necessarily go right back to that moment consciously. But I think subconsciously it was there. I, I wanted something natural. I wanted an environment that was not just not come on in kind of thing. It had to be a journey. Life is a journey. So for the viewing audience to come to Fred Penner's place was not a simple thing. You had to go across a field. You had to jump over a fence. You had to balance on a rock. You had to you know, wave at some animals. You had to do a whole series of things that would finally get you to the lifting of the branches and the crawling underneath or crawling into the log. And then that, that would be the opening. And then, then the, the show would begin when I crawled through the other side, miraculously changing my clothing <laughs> on the way. Yeah, I, 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 I was just watching a <laughs> clip on YouTube and I finally, yeah. you know, I didn't notice that as a, that as a kid. But yeah, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, so, the, the, so the log, which was my idea, that became a... Uh, both a, a, a wonderful physical prop, but truly a very metaphorical prop for for what this journey was, uh, and and then the series ran for uh, for thirteen years, uh, almost a thousand episodes. It it, it made a, a pretty serious impact on a lot of lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you had four siblings growing mm-hmm. up. I mean, was getting away and ha- the time on your own important to you as, as a as a child? Well, I, I was pretty much left on my own. You know, my my older brother and sister they were nine and ten years older, so they oh, were okay. they were off in their world. And and in the in the fifties, I was born in forty six, so in the in the fifties, in my formative years, it was a different time of life. You know, it, it, it's the old go out and play, go out and play, and then at you know at six o'clock, Freddie, it's dinner time, kind of thing. And then you would just play, you'd, you'd go and discover and you know and find life. And now it, we're we're in such a jaded. Now, jaded or fearful time of life, yeah. That 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 doesn't happen anymore. You know, parents need to know where their kids are constantly, and it's uh, it's sad that it's turned that that way. You know, e- even in some of the more protected uh, villages and towns, violence and 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 insanity is rampant. So I'm I, I'm very uh, saddened by the way our life has evolved here. Our 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 society has evolved. But I, I value very deeply the kind of uh, exploration that I was able to do in my in my years, which obviously helped me form a, a strong self and a strong perspective on who I am and a, a level of confidence which I, I I hold dear at this point. So did you, did your parents encourage you to go off and uh, saunter on your own? They they were on their own world. You know, it, it wasn't a matter of of go do that. It, it's just what you did. You know, yeah. you're, you you go visit your friends. I'm going. Bye, mom. I'm going to visit so and so. Okay, I'll see you later. You know, uh, my 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 dad worked uh, uh, well in the army for for most of uh, most of my time with him. He passed away in the early seventies when I was in my early twenties, twenty one. My younger sister Susie. Uh, it was a Down syndrome child. She passed away a year before my dad, so those two mortality checks were in you know, a very serious turning points for my for my life, and it really affected my career uh, absolutely. If if they hadn't passed away when they did, I don't think I would be here today. 
I want to come back to that point because it, it certainly seems like it affected your life path quite a bit. But I'm also interested, first, where did, when did you start getting interested in music? Was it from a very young age? Were you passionate about listening to music and, and playing yeah, music? Yeah, clearly. B birth, I think, was the, it was a turning point. Yeah. Uh, my older brother and sister had the, the music of the, you know, the 50s, you know, running, running constantly. So it was the early, early boy bands. And uh, um, my, my mom and dad loved the swing music from that era, the Tommy Dorsey, you know, Benny Goodman stuff. Uh, and my dad was also very much a uh, an opera and classical music, you know, uh, aficionado. And and so he he was. Uh, I remember scenes of him air air conducting orchestras. You know, he'd, he'd go into the living room, put on put on some piece, and he would stand there, and you know, and, and and conduct and just play that. So it was seriously in in him. Uh, uh, so so the music was around me and varied music constantly. Uh, but I I have a really strong musical memory. So those those songs got in inside of me, you know, very clearly. So when I when I'm creating something now, I have this wonderful spectrum. You know, it's not. It's not pigeonholed at all, though the way music is now. Um, and so, in, in high school, I mean, you you went to uh, high school. I heard with Neil Young. Neil Young. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's. I I was there. I saw him there. We we weren't friends. He, he weren't. He, uh, you know, he was there for mm, maybe a year at most. It, it, he just sort of flopped in. His dad was a sports writer for the Toronto Star, I think, back then, and they they moved back to to Winnipeg for a time and. Uh, and he, and he came to Kelvin. Uh, I don't think he ever graduated from Kelvin because he he was just into his music world. He drove a 1955 black Chevy hearse. That was his car of choice. And he was always, you know, then surrounded by a, a bevy of young boys and girls, young men and women. They 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 it was, he had this charisma about him that was uh, was quite amazing but once you become a teenager and, and get into high school this is when you really start getting involved actively with music too right you join choirs and uh yeah yeah of course i mean from from grade four oh, know, even from grade oh four. yeah yeah no i mean my early as as soon as there was something musical i gravitated to it so i was in choirs from from grade four all the way through you know junior high school high school uh operettas um musical comedies uh dramatic pieces along the way, uh, choirs, male choirs, mixed choirs. So you were addicted to the arts from uh, an early age. Yeah, but uh, but oddly, nobody, you know, as, as, as much as I loved it, and people seemed to appreciate what I was able to do, nobody ever told me that this was a an option, a life option. Um, so I just did it totally as extracurricular. Um, it it sounds like uh, Susie had uh, your your younger yeah. sister who had Down syndrome. Yeah. She had a big effect on on you sort of coming to the realization of the power of music. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I was uh, in in my teens when she was when she was eight nine years younger than I, and she was. Uh, I, I mean, any of your listeners who have have dealt with special needs children, especially Down syndrome, they they are 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 closer to 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 the spirit than 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 the rest of us I believe and so the music that that uh, that she would listen to one of her favorite albums was West Side Story and Leonard Bernstein I mean that album is is so iconic it, it's I mean I, to, to this day it's one of the finest you know collections of music ever but Susie would listen to the you know and there's some heartfelt tunes in it but she would listen to the music and get uh, you know as a teenager watching her, do this this was where the effect happened is she got so engrossed in the sound you know it's like nothing else existed except her and these musical patterns and then at the end of a song you know I mean, it's designed for emotional impact but she would start crying and she'd sort of flop down and then, then she'd she'd get up and you know be happy but uh but i didn't realize that music could go that deep into the soul and and so that that formed a little benchmark. I think as we go through life, there's little emotional things that that form ultimately our perspective of life and of ourselves. Uh, it, it, a teacher somewhere in 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 your 
in your background, Kevin, who who said, you're doing a great job. That is a fantastic picture. Well done. You know, a little, little verbal or, or physical pat on the back, and you feel your spine straighten for a moment. And it's, oh, okay, yeah, all right, good. I feel good about that. So you put those pieces together in a lifetime, and then it forms your your awareness, your emotional foundation. And so Susie was, was a clear point for that. And then as the years went by, I worked with you know, physically, mentally challenged kids in residential treatment centers, and there were more benchmarks in my music connecting with them that formed this foundation for me. So we would we would we would play together, but it, it wasn't sort of in in a therapeutic kind of way. We do we just interact, and, and and musical patterns were were part of that. Um, yeah, but but the but the just the awareness of how how deeply she was affected by it was the was the key to that relationship. And it seems like it affected your philosophy too. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the the philosophy ultimately, and and I and this is sort of the catchphrase that I bring to early childhood conferences. You know, when I'm when I'm presenting keynote addresses, never underestimate your ability to make a difference in the life of a child. And that's that's not a trite phrase. That is bottom line phrase. And and if we if we do believe that, then everything we do needs to be focused on. On the child, if there's if there's uh, you know a, a flutter in the space time continuum for the for that child, bring that back into the center. Make sure they understand where they are. When I when I worked with uh, the the behavior problem kids and physically mentally challenged kids in the in the early early seventies late sixties, uh, one of the keys to that was children who who had been abused, who had gone through devastating times in the, in, in their development in their life was letting them know that they were the victims, not the cause of of the problem. So so approach, they would have internalized the abuse and, and Yeah, so oh yeah. Out. And 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 then it becomes I, I I will deliberately do something bad because that's what I've been told I am. I'm a bad person. So I do something bad to reinforce my self image. So it's all about self image. It's all about identity. And if the child grows up with a positive identity then they are more capable, more able to make positive decisions about their life path. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the core of why resources need to be focused on, on the young child. And, it, and it's not that way. You know, in, 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 in our, our system, it, it's, it's let things happen the way they will, and then we'll deal with it when they grow up, and, and, and then they get into drugs and, and, and abuse, and the rest of that happens. You know, if if the whole the system is upside down, now more resources go into high school and university, than go into developing a strong child. You know, and and it's it's just so, in my perspective, just completely wrong in 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 line. So, what do you attribute your positive identity towards? You, I mean, you clearly grew up with a lot of confidence. Um. Yeah, I I don't I don't know why. Why I've turned out the way that I, I turned out. My, it, probably my my mother was was the biggest influence. My mom was was the rock. It was a matriarchal family. My father was alcoholic, and uh, and you know so that that world was 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 shaky, but but mom always held held things together. I'm I'm quite similar to my mother in attitude to life. She she uh, she was a very um, compassionate human being. Uh, and she was very aware of, of, of hurting other people's feelings. And uh, and I'm I'm like that too. I I don't I don't like uh, negativity. I don't like bad vibes. And so I'll, I'll I'll try and stay as as aware as I possibly can, so that if if there is a flutter in the system, then it's okay. Let what what was that? Uh, you know, I, I, it's hard to say. You know how how I ultimately you know came to 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 be the person I am. Uh, I, again, it's those life experiences that that you go through along the way, and the things that have that emotional impact on you. I, I mean, the, the kids again, the kids that I worked with at Children's Home of Winnipeg, uh, severely emotionally affected kids, and Noel School for Boys in Winnipeg with the uh, behavior problem children. Those things. Uh, just affected me very deeply. Um, music was a very big part of my connection with them, 
But it, you, I mean, you never know how how life what what it's going to deal you along the way and how you perceive things. But, but timing was certainly a, a, a key element in the seventies when uh, uh, when I left the band in the late seventies. Uh, my wife and I started a children's dance theater company just out of the blue, and that led into ultimately the offer to do The Cat Came Back. And right. It was, you know, so things, that's hard to define. But back to your family life, I mean, was there a lot of turmoil? I, I mean, when when a parent is an alcoholic, that's often a, a source of a, for a lot of turmoil and fighting and, and grief in well, family. Well, dad, dad was fortunately a, a, a very passive uh, alcoholic. You know, so there, there was no, there was no real violence, but it was the disappointments of uh, of things that you, as a teenager, particularly wanting to have a strong relationship to a father, and doing things with dad, you know, father and son things together, and I could count on one hand the number of you know moments that I that I considered were you know in that in that spectrum. And and that that was that was hard on me. So I I became more uh, of of a, uh, my mother was obviously a stronger influence, as I was saying. Uh, so my my yin and yang balance maybe were a little a little out of whack. And I I don't think I learned learned to be a a, a good a father or husband along the way. I know it was I I was I was very self. So not self-centered, not not selfish, but but very self-aware of of where I was in the balance, and and, and being the the middle child again, I was always trying to trying to find the the balance with you know if mom was upset about something, then I would I would try and get the balance with dad, and oh dad come on come on back sit down uh, mom okay, so I was always the pacifier, in the in the situation. And did you almost feel like you had to be? Uh... Uh, a father, or uh, almost of a big brother to your younger siblings. Um, a, a little bit. Mum again. Mum was was all, was always there. So so mum was was mother. Father was was trying to trying to make make enough money to keep the family going. I mean, we we weren't we weren't well off, but uh, you know, we obviously never starved. Uh, but it, it was a it was a, a challenging beginning. But I I, I certainly think that I, I learned. Uh, a lot about myself in that in that process, and then as years went by, and I, you know, I, I you do that analysis, and you know, when when you reach your your adulthood and think what what were the things that affected you, and, and whether you go into therapy or, or what else, there you have to understand how your youth affected you so that you can deal with it as an as an adult, because we we all go through stuff for that, and. Uh, um, there's there's two phrases that I, I I have adopted as my mantras in a way, or guiding guiding lines at, at any rate. Uh, one is, don't compare yourself with others, lest you become vain or bitter, and that's that probably is the most critical one. Is as soon as you get into comparison, you're either not as good as or better than, and and then you're either then both those scales just don't work. So it's try to be. It, it, it's very much a Zen thing and a Buddhist thing. It's, it's find, find who you are, do your breathing, stay with your purpose and focus, and you know and that kind of thing. And the other is there, but for the grace of God, go I. And I, for who knows what reason, how this evolved for me, uh, is is an unknown. I I could easily have gone off on a path. I could have followed my my father's footsteps and you know been in a, a corner somewhere just drinking. Uh, and why didn't that happen? You know, wh- why why didn't I let the negative things that may have happened to me in my life affect me in a negative way, so that I'm I'm not a, uh, a, a I think a relatively balanced and connected person as I feel I am now, a confident person now. Mm-hmm. You know, so <clears throat> you, you never know where things are going to go, but but I've you know I've gained understanding of myself and of life and and perspective, and, and that ultimately is has formed a, a pretty strong foundation. So like you said, you went to, uh, you, you never occurred to you early on that uh, you could do music or art as an actual no. living. So, so you go to the University of Winnipeg uh, for economics and, and psychology. Yeah. Um, what, what was your university life like? 
did you, were you enjoying oh, university? I was a terrible student, and I'm 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 just not a good student. I'm I'm very much uh, experiential, and and uh, and I have a fairly good short term memory. So that so the cramming you could cram all night. I it? I could do the cram and I I could get a C, <laughs> and I was happy with a C. Oh thank goodness, you know I, I so I'm I'm average, average to the core, and I had uh, tried to figure out what am I going to do with my life, and uh, I I went to the student counselor and said with a BA what kind of jobs can I get with a BA so after the first first year. And they said, well, you know, psychology's out because you need at least a master's or a PhD because you're going to teach or whatever. English, not 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 so much same thing, you know, wherever that goes. Philosophy, no, it's all arts based. Uh, I wasn't great in in the sciences. I enjoyed them, but uh, but, but that wasn't a, a driving force. So it came down to well, economics. You can actually there are positions open now for a BA in economics, and so I thought, well. Okay, why not? You know, so I, I played with that, and and I I knew that a BA general is just a general arts program anyway. You don't you don't ever really get a job yeah. with a BA or, or not enough information uh, learning with BA. So I I uh, I I did the BA economics and I wrote my civil service exams, and I was in the top ten percentile of that. So I was primed. Really? I was good. Yeah, I was I, I was average, and they want they want average. They want you know, they want lemmings to, to just come in and, you know, jump off the bridge when you say jump. And uh, so I was primed to be an economist with the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And that's when Susie passed away and my father a year later. And so the mortality rocked my world. And, so so uh, were you still in university or, or had you just graduated? No, no, I, I, I was, uh, I had just graduated. There was, there was Susie... No, I think Susie passed nine seventy, right? I, in in my last my last year in June, uh, before my last year, and then my father died uh, a year later. Oh, but I I graduated. My dad was at my graduation, which is nineteen seventy. I'm 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 losing my timeline here, but 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 dad made it to the graduation, and that was really critical because I was the first of of my generation, my 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 cousins. To ever go to university, so it was really about living out Dad's dream because he was never able to go to university. The war in a family sort of stopped him at the door. Um, so I, I was being the doting son, completing a university program to make him proud of me. You know, because it was all about make your dad proud, make your dad proud. That was a driving motivation. Oh too. yeah, you know, because because I, I I I didn't have the kind of father that that I. Ultimately, now wish wish I had had, and I wish he'd he'd been around to be a grandfather to to my kids, you know. So I I feel a little a little cheated on that side of the scale, but you know, but that's not not a serious thing. It it was part of my evolution. So I've I have understood that. I've accepted that. I've embraced that uh, to a degree. So uh, so so, Dad. Um, Dad saw the graduation, passed away, you know, not not too long after that, uh, and uh, and there I was with with mortality clearly looking me straight in the eye, and saying, "What what are you what are you going to do? What are you going to do?" So this really shook you. The, the... Well, yeah, you know, I mean, you're at 21 years old, you know, to lose two of the, the most important people in your in your life, uh, it's it, it's a it's a rocker. It's a it's a a, a turn of time mortality is a great motivator uh, I've talked to actually many many musicians and actors that I know and uh, and we when we get into the conversation it's yeah mortality you know you you know that that is a turning point in your life because it it's the it, we, we all get get so lost in our in our own day-to-day patterns you know the, the the things that we create the relationships we have the, uh, the 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 jobs that we get into trying to trying to make the the econom- the economics of our lives work, and then all of a sudden somebody grabs you you know by the back of the collar and pulls you out of the uh, out of the pool for a second and says look at this what are you doing what really what are you doing is this what you want to do where is your bliss what do you want to, what do you want to do with your life really I mean you're you've got one life to live you know is this really the way you want to do it and so you 
you stop and you and you analyze and you think about what what this could be you know what uh what negative things you're doing to yourself uh that that may not ever be uh resolved uh it it, it, it you have to analyze constantly where you are and, and who you are and what you're doing and how you react to the people and it's uh, it's so critical you know in, in our world because the uh, and I'm, I'm off on a bit of a tangent here. You may have to bring me back, but um, the the government systems. I mean, the when I was growing up in the '60s, I'm, you know, the hippie world, Big Brother was was always the the, the big the phrase. You know, beware, Big Brother is watching. Big Brother is watching. Well, Big Brother is here. The government systems are Big Brother, and they are trying to give you. This is my rant for the day. <laughs> they're, they're, they're trying to compartmentalize you, to put you in such a pressure situation that you are afraid of the things around you, that you're afraid to say what you really feel for fear of, of crossing lines and being challenged and then being uh, through, through social media or through the media world, being uh, who knows what's going to happen. Having a voice is so critical, and I think people are afraid of speaking out for things that really concern them now, because of of the way that the the system is manipulating us, the the credit system has has torn the world apart. You know, when when they came out with this piece of plastic that people believed was going to make their lives easier, without knowing, without anybody saying, oh, by the way, if you don't pay this up, you're going to be paying twenty percent interest. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's that that is that is criminal. The government should have. Somebody should have said, "No, no, don't do that." You know, so I, th- th- that whole th- there's my 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 economics world coming out. So so we've gone off on this this tangent that is is totally abusive to society. And what I'm hoping that that part of my connection with 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 you and and with this generation is pay attention. You know, you you're you're beautiful, young, growing. You you are the next generation. You are inspiring to me you know the, the the people that i've met at the, at the campuses who are are getting into you know really interesting things in the world well that's do it get out there and and make that difference you know be positive be strong be be connected and this and, tragedy in your life was that wake-up call for you or that sort of push? yeah yeah that that's the one that turned turned me turned me around and it's and it's still i mean i i still hold that very very clearly i'm a, i'm a, a very uh, my my youthful exuberance is is uh, is strong constantly. I I love what I do. Um, I love that I've been allowed to do what I do. Uh, the the feedback that happens uh, is again constant. So I'm I'm uh, I'm given support for my path. I mean when 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 you sent me the email, it was right on. That's great. That's that's uh, that's what I. Um, that's why I'm here is because this this is important you know for for me to speak with you to another audience about about the the value of not just my life but the value of a life and being being aware and positive about where you're going so in this period I mean what uh, this is when you started your introspection and like well what do I want to do with my life what's yeah. really my purpose what's my philosophy what did that like what did that look like were you going on long walks or yeah. were you going through like a lot of angst or how, well, how, did, how did you start trying to tackle that in, in face of this uh, uh, the death of your you know dad and your s- specifics I don't remember generals it's I I remember the 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 phrase of following my bliss the word bliss sort of jumped in. I mean, you know, it was '60s stuff here. You know, it, 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 it's poetry. It, you know, it, it's Rod McEwen stuff. It's uh, uh, it's that whole because the '60s was a very introspective time of life. Uh, the, the 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 music from uh, from all the, the great performers from from Joni, including Neil and Gordon Lightfoot and Cat Stevens. It was all about being aware of the things around you you know so i and and this music was was in me because I, I i was the i was the uh the the ski bus geek you know at the back with the guitar singing all the tunes uh so what i i was at that crossroads of my life and what am i going to do what is it that i have done 
in the past that has given me a sense of bliss, a sense of, of positive connection. And I thought, boy, I, I love to sing. I love being on stage. I love performing. There's something, you know, important in me about that. And, uh, and so I thought, well, I, I play guitar pretty well. I know lots of songs. Uh, I went to a, uh, a lounge in Winnipeg. Uh, some of your listeners may, may recall on the corner of Isabel and Notre Dame is a bar. It's called the Balmora Hotel. And there's a lounge in there called the Can Can Lounge, and it still exists today. And uh, I don't know whether somebody mentioned that to me or I went there on my own, but I, I auditioned for the for the the lounge manager, and he said, "Great. When when can you start? Wonderful. When 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 do you need me? Well, how about this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, twenty five bucks a night, nineteen seventy one. Great. I'm in. And so I I got up on stage and I sang. I sang songs. I just sang the, the tunes that I, I knew. People seemed to relate. And I I think a, a critical part for me is uh, the, the 60s was about participation. You know, it was that, that whole, you know, anti-Vietnam world. It was get that voice going. Maybe that's what I'm talking about is I want everybody to be back in the 60s and to be aware of themselves as we seemed to be back then. But... Um, the participation in the songs, I could sing the chorus and the verses of hundreds of songs that from that era, and, and th- that seems to have disappeared a, a bit now. You know, you, there's great grooves, neat, neat patterns, but the sing-along component is not as strong as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, but in, in, my, in my work, it's all about that. You know, in, in working with children, with families, it's it's come on along. We we have, and and I think of my performance now very much as a dialogue, with a dialogue between me and the child, between me and the adult, the caregiver, and then ultimately between the caregiver and the child. So there's this triangular uh, dialogue that will will continue to happen. So I, I try to open up concepts that 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 you can put a phrase to, or a musical line to that that will bring all of us a little closer together. Yeah, I mean it's it's not just about a love. Or music for you, it's about making a positive impact. Yeah, clearly. But with a child, you can't just talk to a child. That doesn't always work. But music sometimes can have a really positive line because it's something that you can learn. You can learn a song. You can understand the words. And the words can sometimes help you feel good about yourself. You know, so so the so the the therapeutic value of music became stronger and stronger in my in my perspective uh, and i guess also the value of attention <laughs> because you mentioned like how important it is <coughs> to you to be accessible <coughs> pardon me um uh yeah i, I guess when, when when you do something that that is that has a positivity to it and you and you feel a a strong good reaction to it it does make you feel good about yourself and uh, and the more of those that you do, the better you feel about yourself. So uh, I I'm I'm sure that there was there was that in my in my life perspective in why I did things so that I would feel accepted, and uh, and and feel a sense of a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, of self awareness and purpose. And I mean we and ultimately that's something we all really need in 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 a life and and I, I you know back to the economic thing I think we get so trapped in in maintaining uh, or, or not knowing the difference between need and want you know the the desire for things and the ability to throw the plastic down and who cares about paying later we we lose that perspective between need and want and 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 going back to a base and saying what you no know, in in life what do you really need i mean there are the basic human rights parts you know you need food you need shelter you need you need clothing but from an emotional point of view what do you need to become a stronger person and and those can be harder to find because it because it makes you because you have to be vulnerable to discover those things and that's a key part of of uh, being a musician, being an actor, is you have to learn about vulnerability. Um, and and I, I 
I was a, I, I read a number of books at uh, psychology books at university that talked about vulnerability, and I, I thought, oh, okay, that's I I understood that, and it helped me um, know or or learn about myself through through these words and phrases, and it, it, I guess a kind of therapeutic. Uh, path through through the books that I read, and I guess also I mean people with Down syndrome of, often are more sensitive and vulnerable to mm. to things or to criticisms or good or bad uh, attention than than a lot of us. They don't have that same facade up. That's true. One one of the neatest things I, I've been involved in many uh, Down syndrome conferences across the country. In fact, Winnipeg is hosting the National Down syndrome conference in May this year that I'll be part of, and. Uh, and it's it's the most one everybody should do this because you you walk in in the door and you check your ego, just put that off to the side. Uh, there there's because ego does not exist in this in this in this world because you you will get you will get hugs and love from from total strangers. You you will experience an emotional level that that perhaps you've never had before. Uh, I. I, I, I love going to, to the conferences. I love doing things, particularly with the Down syndrome world, because you, you, can, just, you can just play on, a, on another dimension completely. Uh, you let your guard down and just be a kid again. Just, well, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I've, I've got a pretty good sense of, of what that is. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a responsible hi- human being, and, a, and, and I, I've learned how to do that. But I think deep down inside, we, we, are, we are children. We are very vulnerable people that we, we put up our guards, we put up the walls that protect us from the things that are out there to, to cause damage, to cause hurt. But, uh, but bottom line is we, we, we really would like to go back. So when you, when you get into music, I mean, you've said that you feel a strong responsibility that... Mm-hmm. Uh, for what you do and and for your impact on the world. So was this responsibility immediately there when you decided to go into music and and the arts, or did that develop over time? Well, inevitably, it it did develop. Uh, I, from the musical connections that I had in the residential treatment world, uh, I I knew there there was there was value to it. I knew the value that it had for me. In, in, in making me a stronger person. Uh, but one of the uh, fairly critical moments that happened that, that sort of drove that point clearly home to me was after the Cat Came Back album had been produced in 1979 in the fall, that Christmas I was doing a concert at the University of Manitoba and uh, I sold out great. You know, I had, had my, my boxes of, of records, sold those out. And uh, as I was signing autographs, there was uh, one woman who was waiting at the back of the theater. And, um, and I, I saw her standing there, and she was just sort of holding her position. Uh, I finished signing autographs. She came forward, I- introduced herself. She was a mother of three children, and her youngest child was four years old. They had bought the Cat Came Back record the time before, had played it for the family. The youngest child had developed a, a brain tumor, they brought a little record player into the hospital, and uh, and played played the music together, and it was a bonding moment for for the family through this music, and uh, and the the child ultimately did pass away, but she really wanted me to know how valuable that music was for her child and their family in keeping them together during the most devastating time of a of a family's life. I thought, okay. That's what it is. This is not just a matter of you know singing some songs. This is it's never been that. There there is a, an absolute responsibility to bring a a a, a, a message, a positivity, not not in a didactic way, obviously, because that can turn off, but but approaching things as uh, uh, in in as strong a uh, a perspective as as I possibly can as as a uh, as a man as a human being uh, as a father as as a mentor as what whatever roles I have in this world is being that and and letting 
my my being, my voice, my my body, my talent be the channel through which that happens. And I mean, very often I I wonder where things come from, and and uh, I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person, and I feel that that I am a vessel in many ways. That things happen sometimes that you just cannot define, and 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 you know that there's there's another force at work here, and. Uh, and, and I am at a point in my life, after I've been doing this for 40 years, I understand my position in this world. I, I appreciate deeply what people have given me. And, and, it's, and there's no ego. There's, there's nothing out there that, that is, is negative about how I feel about, about this. I mean, it's really an interesting path and life perspective. And I'm... Uh, and I, I embrace it, and I I just continue. So, 1979, uh, a benefactor is someone just comes up to yeah, you and, and <laughs> says, "I you are performing with your wife," uh, and they offer to make to, uh, give you money yeah, for now. Basically, it was a, a, a doctor who I'm still in in touch with in Winnipeg. He's a radiologist. He and his wife and their two kids came to one of the shows that we were doing. After the performance, they, they came up and said, you know, we, we love your voice, love the music. Do you have a record? And in 79, I thought, no, I, I have no idea what that is. You know, I'm, I, 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 I tend to just, in life, and, I, and, I've, and I've done this, and fortunately it's, it's come back, is I, I just go along. I'm, I do what I do. I put out what I can. And then somebody else, often an, ex, an external, <clears throat> excuse me, an external force comes up and says, have you ever tried doing that? Why don't you try this? And, and I'm saying, well, do you think I can? Well, yeah, why, why not? Oh, sure, okay, and then I'll, I'll have the confidence to follow that. So, uh, so they, they approached me and, uh, and asked if I had a record, and I, I said no, and they said, well, we, we like your voice, we like your music, we think you should do it. How much would it cost? I said, well, I don't know. You know I said, well, we'll, we'll finance it. And, and essentially they gave me a blank check. Uh, I, I talked to some musician friends, got some producers, started digging back in my own childhood, finding songs that had value to me that I remembered, uh, like uh, like Ghost Riders in the Sky and The Cat Came Back and It Ain't Gonna Rain No More and I'm, uh, Little White Duck. I mean, songs that I remembered from my childhood and I do have a good musical memory. I thought, well, that'd be a good song to put on. Oh, and here's a story. I'll write music for that, and we'll do this. So I, I found a core of tunes that I wanted to present, and uh, about eight grand later, uh, we'd, we'd produced The Cat Came Back at Channels Music in Winnipeg, and uh, and within six months, I'd made enough to pay them back. And then I connected with Rafi in uh actually just prior to doing the album. And he said, once you've done the album, send us a copy. Maybe we can do some business. Because that was, uh, that's where he was at that point. Uh, talked to him. They loved the album. Did some, you know, m- minimal changes to it. And then uh, I toured with him for a couple of years. And this then, really launched your career. Yeah. So that, that was, the, the, the album was there. Linking with Rafi was, was critical because he already had a national network going so I toured with him I guest spotted on his concerts and and very quickly I mean within within a year I was doing my own you know solo performances or, or with with the, with a with a band uh for about 5 years and that's when CBC was watching my evolution because Sharon Lawson Bram Raffi and myself were really the only three who were doing this the the generation the the boomers of which I am a part were demanding quality entertainment for their children. And they, they, they didn't want old stuff. They wanted new energy to come in. And that's where how Rafi came into the, in, into the fold because his mother-in-law was an uh, a, a elementary school teacher or a nursery school teacher, and they had no music for the kids. He was a, a budding folk singer, and, they, uh, and she said, the mother-in-law said, why don't you do a, a record for kids, singable songs for the very young? You know, now it's million, million seller. So uh, so Rafi started the ball rolling, and Sharon Lowe and Bram and I came all along about the same time. So it was a very fortuitous time of life. The, the 70s were, were really vibrant turning point. We were doing uh, like 
sh- multiple shows in large venues. I, I was just thinking the other day, I played at the Cleary Auditorium in Windsor. I remember doing five shows, five sold-out shows to 2,000 people in one weekend. Wow. You know, it was a, it was high high level stuff and and so for the cbc not to be aware of that would have been you know pretty foolish um and so like the album they it, it happens in the same sort of way where they approach you and say hey would yeah you like a tv show out of exactly completely out of the blue i had no anticipation for that i'm uh we, we, by the time cbc came along we did we had done three four albums you know, so the so the music was seriously flowing through at that point, and and then CBC called, and it was okay. And Raffi at that point was moving into the states and wanted to do that on his own. So I was cut loose and and started a new management relationship, and then it just built from there. And were you touring all all these years too, like pretty pretty heavily? Oh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, serious touring. That was uh, mainly uh, Canadian touring, coast to coast stuff. Uh, every little community, every major community, like months on the road. Uh, n- no, the, I I try to keep the because you know I, I we had our, our first child uh, in 1981. We were married in 1980. Our first child in 81. Uh, second child in 85. You know, so those were uh, family years, and I I tried to keep my touring down to like three weeks max. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it, it wasn't the Charlie Daniels trip here. Uh, yeah, so three, three, three weeks at a time, and, and but that that was that was hard, and you know, it was was difficult being away from learning how to deal with that. To because I'm I'm a very grounded person, and being out in the in that world of of adoration and love, and realizing that <clears throat> that's not the real world. You know, you 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 have a occupation, a position. People adore you because of of that iconic thing that you you may have developed, but. Once that stops, you you've got to have roots planted, or else you'll you'll be lost completely. And I, I think that's something that every performer has to deal with at some point. Yeah, probably why there's so many child stars end up having so many problems. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, seriously, because that, that that's it's as wonderful as that is, it's not reality. Yeah, and as soon as it's not there, then who are yeah. you? Um, so 1985, you, you start the show. I mean, and you were given pretty free reign to make it what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah, she Dodie Robb was the head of children's television in '85, and and uh, I said what, and she said think about it, and and so I I came up with the log concept, the natural environment, you know, it, it, it's not it it's not uh, it's not early arborite. There's there there there's trees, there's forests, there's these areas you can go and sit and you know. So it had that very uh, homey is maybe not the right word. But but a very relaxed and natural environment, and that was really critical to me. And uh, and some of the writers here in, in Toronto, Dodie Robb and Peg Mc no not Dodie Robb, uh, Pat Patterson, and Peg McKelvey were the first two writers here in, in Toronto, and they they started writing scripts for me. And uh, I mean, this must have been very different from being there in person performing for a group of kids and suddenly you're behind a screen and yeah. you don't necessarily see w- what's happening on the other end and if it's connecting or resonating with your audience. Yeah, you don't have the, the immediacy of, of that, certainly. But it was really uh, important for me and I, I remember thinking this consciously uh, that, that when, I, when I looked at that, that camera that that was the, the iris to a generation. I mean, I was very aware of that. But on the other side of it, particularly, it was the iris to one child. So you tried to picture the camera as, as a child. Or... I, no, no. But I, I would when I looked at the camera, it was, it was that. Yeah. You know, it was it was straight into the iris, and and whenever whenever I would uh, sort of drift away, and if we, if we had a particularly heavy day, and and I, and I'm overwhelmed with trying to remember because I, I I did most of it from memory. You know, there'd be some some signs or cards along the way. Uh, but whenever I would sort of drift off the path, my director would contact the floor director, right? Because there's a director in the booth, floor director who trans- translates things, and the floor director would come over to me and you know in a break and look at me and say, "One child, one child," and that brought you back. Yeah, brought me back. So then, then I would look, go back to the camera, and it was uh, totally non-condescending. 
you know, and 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 that's something I pr- I appreciate deeply about myself, is in that series, and maybe that's what what the relate what the relation was with that generation. I heard that you only recorded three months a, a year for for Penner's Place. Uh we did. Um, yeah, we we did. We, we usually do three week sessions, uh, two or three or three or four sessions over the year. We did a couple in Winnipeg and a couple in Vancouver because the series was was uh, produced in Winnipeg and Vancouver over the over the uh, 13 years. Yeah, it wasn't a, a huge amount of time, but it was very intense. The first the first year we did 96 15 minute programs in 3 months. That's a, a huge amount of uh, yeah, it was production. It was very intense. It was a lot of a lot of work, a lot of getting my brain in that in that gear and so you you would like shoot an episode every day we well, no, we would do uh minimum three shows a day there were some days we do five five 15 minute episodes which which were actually about 13 20 you know with with the with the clips taken off but uh very intense you know doing that because it would be script go bump 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 bum, okay cut have a coffee break next you know, it, it would be that kind of intensity where your brain has to, zzz, 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 you know, it, 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 my synapses were uh, were pretty hot back then. Yeah. And in the meantime, I mean, it's probably important not to get stressed out or anything because that could translate. Or... Yeah. yeah and, and I'm I'm not a very stress kind of person. Even in that sort of yeah. environment where... Yeah. I mean, once in a while, it would get, a, I, I, I'd get my, my, my brain would sort of go into the, the thinking zone of uh, okay, where am I going now? And, and it, it would probably look pretty intense from from uh, from the outside. Uh, but then once once the show began, once the countdown came down, that's it, I that's when I felt I could relax. Oddly, you know, it, it's the off stage stuff that is stressful. that is more stressful, right? Because once you once you're on, then 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 you you do what you do. So was the tape live yeah. then? I mean, tape yeah, live yeah, to like you yeah, know live, 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 live to live to tape. Uh, some, I mean, I, but if it if it hit the wall, then it would be okay. Let's let's go back. Let's go back. But most times it was uh, pretty straight through. You know, minimal editing. And did you did you get a sense of of how influential this program was at the time? Because I. You know, kids aren't necessarily the ones to write in to a program saying we we love this, we pretty, love for parents. Uh, well, the, the the feedback from parents came through pretty quickly. Uh, that that their kids loved it. That yeah, you know that, that they, they 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 enjoyed the show. They because um, CBC was you know would would receive um, mail from the population. Uh, you know, but but the odd thing was. For the 13 years, it was never absolute that it was going going the next season. You know, so you it, always felt uh, like you were on the verge of being canceled? Exactly. Why? Uh, who knows? They, it was they there. just like made that sort of clear it, that it's, it, nothing's guaranteed? They, it was, uh, are, are we going uh, another year? Well, I hope so. The, you know, the producer, director would say, uh, they're, they're, they're working on scripts. The system is... Is happening, but we don't have a schedule yet. Is it going? I don't know. Yes, it's going. Oh, good. Okay, now we can, you know, relax into it. And the next year, oh, I don't know. Is uh, okay, it's going, which is really pretty foolish way of, of doing it. Yeah. And then and then when it was fi- when it finally ended in 1997, I was going into the studio that morning with I was writing songs in in the car as as we were driving. You know, getting ready for the three shows that we were planning on doing that day, got there and uh, said, "This is our last show." What? This is series is canceled. It was that quick. It was stupid quick. It was ridiculous. And what do they say? What do they give as the reason? The, the, that n- was never clearly defined to me. I mean, years years later, talking to the uh, the, the director that I uh, that we had at the, at the end, Leslie uh, Oswald was her name. Uh, and th- there apparently were some personality things along the way that, that there were there was a uh, a part of the CBC world who didn't really like what I was doing, did didn't like my my energy. Was there was a negativity that somehow they they felt toward me. Um, 
So did you fight for the anyway, show? Like when when they there's nothing I couldn't. There's nothing. It was just like no. this is a yeah. This is fait I mean, accompli. I, it's already done. Yeah. Uh, the, the they there was uh, there was a meeting soon after that. So they didn't even like sit you down for a meeting first. They just no. Said, Boom. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. It's just the way that that turned. Uh, but th- there there was there was a meeting after that. You know to 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 give me the official written document. Uh, but it was. Uh, it, it was just this is this is what it is. This is you have no choice in that. Um, and and w- when the series ended in ninety in ninety seven, they still had three or four years of royalty free time that they could have used the series that they could have aired it, continued, and it never it never saw the light of day. It's never seen the light of day since then. They pulled it off the air, and uh, for all I know, it's sitting. In a waste bin somewhere. And so we, did you flounder a bit? I mean, this was your... Oh, yeah. Of, oh, sure. I mean, this was... This main was, purpose. This was my life for 13 yeah. years. This was my... You know, I, I was still in, you know, in, in the balance season. I would do lots of lots of touring. Um, my, my management out of Winnipeg, Pac Can Entertainment, uh, still had gigs for me and uh, conferences. I mean, I was still doing stuff, but this was my serious bread and butter. And uh, so when, when that ended, it was... Oh, okay. Well, I am a, a survivor. I'm a resilient person. I'll keep going. Uh, so gigs kept happening, but it was I, I did feel I was on a bit of a treadmill that it was just spinning my wheels. It was I was making a living, but it was where's this going to go next? What's the next piece? I mean, when the record came along, when when CBC came along, when all these other things came to me from an external source. Okay, what's next? What's next? And there was no what next, you know, that was revealing itself quickly. So I, you know, I I, I became a bit internally reclusive. Uh, I, I started feeling a little less significant in uh, in the world. So after the series was pulled off the air, it, it was it was flounder, it was spin the wheels, it was wait for the next round until. Uh, until the your generation started reaching adulthood and saying, "Oh, what were my children's child influences?" and they they started connecting about six seven years ago now. Um, and, and in those interim years, I mean, did you stop touring for a while, or were you no, always no, I've, just... no, I, no, I, I've never stopped touring. You were always touring. Yeah, it was always touring, and it, th- that's that's what I do. You know, that's uh, that's the only because I I've not had any other occupation. In forty years, this is this has been it, you know. So you find ways of doing that. You know, I, I did some plays along the way. Uh, I, I have I have acting ability, so uh, I would do you know production along the way. Uh, so there was always something to do, but but in the back of my mind is, wow, I, it feels like it should go somewhere else. Something else has to happen. It has to has to grow. I, I, you know I. In a, in a, again, a non egotistical way, but you know, so there, there were all these questions in my mind of, okay, where is this going to, where is this going to go now, and um, and and then the university thing started to build. You you got an original <coughs> email from uh, a student at McGill, was it? Yeah, there was uh, uh, there, there were there were several things, even prior to that, you know, of 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 that connection happening, and immediately I know that if one email gets to me, that. Can easily be extrapolated to a, a Probably very means large. other people are are remembering your show. Yeah, right? yeah. The, the, there's, it's not one person. It has to be uh, a, a larger group. So it, I started thinking, oh, oh, okay. And, and I knew that Mr. Dressup had gone back to universities and done done uh, you know visits. So, so okay. So then you start going to universities and performing, and uh, and it sounds like this connection was quite uh, quite gratifying. For oh, you. it was it was phenomenal. You know, because I I hadn't again I. Hadn't anticipated this, uh, but it's like you it, planted seeds, you know, yeah. 15, 15, 20 years ago, and suddenly you're, yeah, you're seeing the impact they yeah. had. Yeah, and that's that's a very accurate way of, of putting it. Uh, the and, and these seeds are are uh, the benefits are being reaped now on a wonderful, very personal, and um, and heartfelt level. <clears throat> Yeah, the 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 McGill thing when when that when that came through and and I was playing some school shows in uh, in in, uh, in Montreal, 
and, and they suggested that I come down on a Friday afternoon after these other shows were finished uh, to a little place called Gert's Lounge that only holds 100 and 125 people. And I'm, I remember walking down the hallway with the student union rep, hearing this din of, of blah, 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 activity, of sound, you know, voice, came around the corner, and there was this maze of people had squeezed into this little lounge, you know, the double the size. They were hanging from the, you know, rafters. I sort of, you know, wedged my way through to the front, and uh, and we had a we had a love in. I was there for a couple hours plus, uh, talking, singing, uh, asking, a- answering questions, interacting. There were there were hugs and tears, and it was a a very very <clears throat> emotional time to say the least. Emotional because you well, felt like you were finally well for for the for the students for these for this generation it's reliving their childhood yeah you know what we're coming back was that that seed that was planted how however that happened was deeply being remembered and recognized and honored I I, I felt very honored that day I I read somewhere that that you said you know you you mentioned before never estimate mm-hmm. the the your ability, ability to impact yeah. positively impact a child um but you also said um in the same vein that don't like connecting with the vulnerable spirit of a child uh is crucial and then that can go on to, to influence positively influence the attitude of the yeah. adult yeah, that's the, the that's the ultimate path, and that's and that's sort of like your bigger purpose. Do you see, like, yeah. like if you set uh, if you make a child be comfortable and uh, believe in themselves, then that will ripple throughout yeah, society. Yeah, I, I, I mean, clearly that goes back to working with the with the the kids in the seventies, the behavior problem, the the mentally challenged, etc. Was if if someone had instead of saying you're you're a piece of crap. You, you, you've ruined my life, had gone the opposite way and said, you're a wonderful human being. I love what you do. They, then that would have you know, straightened the spine and brought them through. So it, it is absolutely clear that if you do say positive things and treat a child with respect at those, particularly in those formative years, I mean, personality is formed in the first six years. If you do that, then you have a chance of affecting adult attitude. And I've I've always believed that because it's it's not a matter of opinion that is a fact, and and what I'm feeling now is that 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 is that you actually had that impact that, that, that yeah that it really that really it really works that how many people have the opportunity to experience that in their own lifetime this is not just a throwaway career this is not just something that I do you know la 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 this has value it has meaning it has importance and uh, I mean it's, it's even political to to you in some sense it sounds like um, or you see maybe larger yeah. societal oh, yeah, yeah oh yeah no but I, like I, as I, you were I, saying if you if you're fearful yourself or if you're in debt or, or any of these things it's you're controlled in a way but if you feel confidence if you feel like you have they, that base then yeah. you're freer to explore and, and experiment with things yeah no I there there is I, I it's a good thing I don't have political aspirations it just I, I, I don't Fred Penner, I, Prime Minister. I, well, I I've had people approach me, you know, just you know, in sort of semi jest, you know, you, you should you should run for mayor, you should you should run for prime minister, you'd be great, you know, you're if 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 I said no, I can't, you know, that's that would just that's much too complicated and much too difficult. Let's keep it let's keep it as simple as possible. You know, work work on one person at a time. I don't know, but you uh, do seem to have sort of beliefs, and uh, you know, you, you believe you yeah. <laughs> believe in the power of the arts, and uh, you know, you've spoken out a bit against the cutbacks um, by the the conservatives yeah. to the arts. Yeah, I mean that that drives me crazy. That the 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 clarity that we we really the arts is critical in this world, and uh, and for. For the for the funding systems not to not to really understand that, you know, essentially that that uh, that you you make ultimately a better person if they are, if they are connected with you know music, theater, dance, that that beautiful world, but at the same time, in in my in my negative uh, uh, awareness or approach of that, 
I, I don't think the system wants the arts to exist because it, it encourages free thinking. It encourages analysis. It encourages criticism of, of what's happening around you because that's what it is. So I think the system wants to put the blinders on, wants you to become bean counters, wants you to become the lemmings of the world, just support support the government system, do what you do, don't, don't, don't ask criticize. Don't ask too questions. Hmm? Don't ask too many questions. No, no, yeah. don't, because, the, the, because you're not going to like the answers. The, the, the government will not like the answers. Mm -hmm. No, it's, uh, yeah, we're, we're absolutely screwed on that on that side people have to stand up i mean you know crit oh golly ford what is he thinking <laughs> we won't go there but yeah but there's you have to stand up and really believe that your voice can be heard you know in the midst of it all there's something that that, that really doesn't fit and feel right in in your perspective on life talk about it say something about it you know get out there and and uh and and slam it because you're because that's your responsibility, and you're gonna keep doing this as uh, <clears throat> as long as you can, I guess. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 yeah. The the R word is not part of my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, no retirement. No, no. I'm in. Uh, I'm in this for life. I I I will continue. I've got lots of festivals and gigs coming up. This is going to be a very busy summer. Uh, I'm, it it's full and uh, and creative, and I'm. Uh, I'm on a roll, Kevin. I'm yeah. on a roll. <laughs> well, you had a you had a big impact on uh, uh, my life. I remember watching you, and uh, I know with many of my friends. And uh, it's exciting to to know that uh, you'll be there for the the upcoming generation too. Oh, I appreciate that. So have a have a chat with the student union people. Tell them that I'm available. Hint, hint. It's only it's only I'm only a call away. I'm <laughs> yeah. only a step away. You've you've got my email. Yes. Yeah. Bingo. Fred, Fredpenner.com. Fredpenner.com will do it. Well, Fred Penner, thanks so much for joining me. We've covered a lot of territory, Kevin. We certainly have. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. That was my conversation with childhood musician and performer Fred Penner, who hosted Fred Penner's Place on CBC from 1985 until 1997. Well, that's all the time we have for the public and Broadcasting Canada this week. As always, you can visit us online at broadcastingcanada.com and then you can listen to some of the other interviews we've done with CPC hosts, ranging from Bob McDonald and David Suzuki to Sheila Rogers and Adrian Arsenault. You can also comment there, or if you want to get in touch with me, you can reach me at kevin at thepublicradio.org. Broadcasting Canada is a special series by CIUT at the University of Toronto, thanks to CIUT station manager Ken Stauer, as well as Eric Betlam. Broadcasting Canada was put together by myself, Kevin Kaners, with help from Joseph Novak, Sharon Riley, Sean Rasmussen, J.P. Davidson, Courtney Clinton, and Brian Colley. And final word, as always, so what is it like to be a Canadian broadcaster? And then all of a sudden somebody grabs you, you know, by the back of the collar and pulls you out of the pool for a second and says, look at this, what are you doing? What really, what are you doing? You've got one life to live. Is this what you want to do? See you next time on Broadcasting Canada.